Good uh, day to all of you participants around the globe who are joining us today for the first webinar organized by the OECD on the anti-corruption reforms in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, focused on asset uh, and interest disclosure. My name is Arisa Lutsevich. I am joining you today as the moderator from London's Chatham House, where I uh, am a research fellow at Russia and Eurasia program and also head of Ukraine Forum. It's a pleasure to have a session today that will dwell in depth into uh, asset declarations and conflict of interest, in particular in the region that is has entrenched practices of corruption and quite a lot of state capture and is trying to make this breakthrough to eradicate corruption, especially high level corruption. Uh, we have an excellent panel today joining us. Uh, I would like to inform all our participants that this session is available also in Russian. And if you go and click the interpretation uh, button on your Zoom, um, screen you will be able to access it in russian and also the original is in english um, and i would like to say that we have an honor and a pleasure uh, to uh, have an excellent session today this session is also streamed live on youtube and is recorded so you will be able to share uh, the proceedings that we'll be discussing today with with your networks uh, and also we have a pleasure to have Deputy Secretary General of, of OECD, Jeffrey Schlagenhauf joining us today with the introductory remarks to introduce the topic of the discussion and to give his brief overview uh, on the subject. Uh, Mr. Deputy Secretary General, over to you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you. And on behalf of the OECD, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar on progress and challenges in the fight against corruption in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Today, we face an unprecedented global crisis that has led to the loss of many lives and widespread social and economic uncertainty. The economic impacts are staggering. OECD estimates that due to COVID-19, global GDP will fall by 4.2% in 2020. At a time when governments face massive financial demands and constraints, they must ensure that their efforts to overcome the crisis are not undermined by corruption and bribery. The private sector likewise faces renewed expectation that businesses will contribute to the wider social good particularly those receiving government support. The OECD has been working with countries in Central Europe and Eastern Europe since the early years of the transition, when countries started to build democracies and liberal economies. This transition created many opportunities, but it also created some big challenges, including corruption, which is today probably the biggest obstacle preventing citizens from enjoying the full prosperity that open markets and democracies can offer. The OECD is proud to have been able to work with you during the transition and to do so in many ways. The Anti-Corruption Network for Eastern Europe and Central Asia, the ACN, is one such example. Since 1998, the network has helped to transfer knowledge from OECD countries to your region. For example, it introduced in your region a peer review program, the Istanbul Action Plan, which is based on the model of the OECD Working Group on Bribery. The ACN has also created a regional law enforcement network, the younger sister of the OECD's group of law enforcement officials. Finally, the network has helped advance the business integrity agenda in the region and provides a forum for mutual learning between countries of the region with OECD counterparts. Today, I'm happy to launch the fourth edition of the ACN's flagship publication, Anti-Corruption Reforms in Eastern Europe, Progress and Challenges, covering the period of 2016 to 2019. The report highlights the progress the region has made in using IT tools to fight corruption, in increasing transparency, and in completing legal reforms. It also stresses that high-level corruption remains the main challenge. High-level corruption is particularly dangerous 
is it undermines the trust of citizens in the state and hinders development and prosperity. Finding effective ways to address this challenge is therefore of particular importance. This report offers some answers and is a rich resource for governments, civil society and development partners alike that will, they will find valuable. I also look forward to the discussion of the ACN network's future work. The main breakthrough will be the use of new performance indicators to measure the progress of governments in fighting corruption. The ACN launched a pilot on December 1st to test the indicators with five ACN countries, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. I very much look forward to the results of this pilot. This work will be not only important for the ACN as a group and the pilot countries themselves, but also for the global community of anti-corruption experts who have found it difficult to develop effective and reliable indicators to measure progress in fighting corruption. Other parts of the OECD <coughs> excuse me, are also working on this challenging task. The Public Governance Directorate is developing indicators for public sector integrity. And the Economics Department is working on indicators that link corruption and economic issues. The work with your region will therefore contribute greatly to a truly global effort. Before concluding, let me stress that the work of the ACN is made possible thanks to the strong support of our partners. The OECD is very grateful to the European Union for its political and financial support in the development of the new EU4 integrity program that will allow the ACN to apply new anti-corruption indicators in practice. Our partnership is important for both the region and the OECD. This program will be integrated and implemented as part of the Open Government Partnership, showing how different or international organizations can unite their efforts for the common good. Finally, I should note that this webinar can only focus on one of the chapters of the report being launched today. We have chosen to focus on the role of asset and interest disclosure in the fight against corruption. This is an area where ACN countries have made a lot of progress recently, sometimes even surpassing OECD countries. I trust that this focus will give you a flavor of the rest of the report, encourage you to read it, and to engage in the work going forward. With this, I would like to wish you an interesting and useful discussion, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to join you today as we try to address collectively this important effort to fight corruption. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Secretary General. I think it's very important that you brought in the pressures coming from the COVID pandemic and the necessities of the public sector to really deliver on so many healthcare uh, challenges, but also economic recovery support to small businesses. And this is where uh, corruption bleeds the capacity of governments to do it and becomes not only the question of get bad governance, but the question of life and death. And I don't think this sounds too dramatic taking into account the year we have been through. Uh, but now uh, I would like to bring in Rusudan Mikelidze, who uh, represents the Secretariat of OSCD Anti-Corruption Network for Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And we will get a flavor of this uh, quite extensive publication where Rusudan will present key findings, but also the way OSCD and ACN would like to bring this area forward in the years to come. Rusudan, over to you. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, DSG. Uh, thank you for the participants to join us um, from all over the globe at the launch of the new report, um, Anti-Corruption Reforms in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, at this very festive occasion of 60th birthday of the OECD. Uh, so today I will present the key findings of the section on asset and interest disclosure and our new approach to monitoring uh, performance of anti um, um, ACN governments um, uh, under performance indicators, including on asset and interest disclosure. Uh, so in this report, you will find the regional analysis that is based on the fourth round of monitoring of the Istanbul Action Plan, which is a peer review program already mentioned by DSG, uh, and the desk research of the Secretariat, 
on the spectrum of the um, anti-corruption issues starting from policy to prevention enforcement and um, some case studies on specific sector, sectors such as uh, tax um, uh, integrity in tax administration. Uh, so the issues uh, discussed in the report, for example, include the independence of judiciary and the prosecutor's office, business integrity, public procurement, um, uh, investigation and prosecution of high level corruption and enforcement of corruption offenses in general. So I really hope that you will find this uh, report useful in your work. The report has the case studies as well as regional recommendations. Um, and one key finding that can be uh, generalized if we oversimplify it would be the following. After 20 years, 22 years uh, of existence of the ACN, the following is the key result. Uh, and I'm sure you have heard this uh, in many events uh, during this month, so around the anti-corruption day, that um, the region as well as the globe has already uh, made a significant progress in introducing anti-corruption policies, institutions and laws. But the key challenge that remains is the enforcement, especially in, the high, in uh, terms of uh, tackling high level corruption. And the same holds true for the section that we are discussing today on asset and interest disclosure. So now let's have a look at these maps and um, talk about the progress and challenges in asset and interest disclosure in four points. The first, first point would be uh, the laws and institutions. So you can see that in all the ACN countries, the legal requirements for asset and interest or asset only <laughs> disclosure exists in all ACN countries. Um, the dedicated institutions are in a fewer countries. However, the progress has been in this area as well. Uh, the challenge remains though, that in some countries, even basic laws are missing. And um, uh, the scope of disclosure that is, for example, the, uh, the subjects of disclosure um, that should be focused on high level and risk positions, as well as the content of disclosure is uneven in the country. So some countries require detailed disclosure of uh, assets and interests that are important for uh, uncovering illicit enrichment and conflict of interest. And some uh, only provide very uh, limited uh, disclosure. Um, the second point is about publication of information. And um, in those countries where the data are open, and especially in open data machine readable format, asset and interest disclosure has proven to be a very, very uh, strong tool for accountability and uh, civic oversight. Uh, but the challenge in this area is uh, again, that um, some countries do not provide for uh, disclosure and uh, do not put the information on their websites and some even regard this information confidential. The third point is about the verification. Uh, verification of uh, asset declarations is key in order to be able to use them as a detection tool uh, for illicit enrichment and conflict of interest. We have seen some pretty good progress on, of risk-based verification. However, um, countries um, have um, challenges such as the lack of uh, independence resources and um, uh, the focus on high uh, risk areas and high level officials. Sometimes verification has been really politicized and used against, polit against political opponents or arbitrarily to the selected group of people. Uh, and last fourth point is about application of sanctions in order for this tool to be even more potent. And uh, in this regard, the enforcement is uh, there in some countries, but we would like to see more of the enforcement, of course, and in relation to high level corruption and risk areas. Uh, now, uh, as already mentioned by DHG, uh, 2021 will be an important year for the ACN since we will start a new methodology of monitoring government performance uh, based on performance indicators. And um, in this presentation, uh, the second half of the presentation will be to demonstrate a little bit to give you a taste of how we are going to do that. Um, 
There are 13 performance indicators that cover issues from anti-corruption policy to prevention and enforcement. Um, and uh, one of them, uh, performance area three, is dedicated to today's theme, asset and interest disclosure. And zooming into this um, area, you can see that we have five performance indicators. The first performance indicator requires that high corruption risk positions are covered. And there's a list of positions um, in the performance indicators, starting from the heads of the government, continues to, um, for example, regional uh, representatives at the um, high level. We also have specific risk positions, such as judiciary, prosecutors, etc. And um, the second one, a second indicator talks about and requires the comprehensive disclosure, which has to do with the depth of the information that is provided that is necessary for uncovering conflict of interest and illicit enrichment. And that includes the list of um, assets and interests uh, that have to be disclosed, beneficial ownership information, expenditures, et cetera, et cetera. And that the, that the, the disclosure should be regular at irregular intervals, such as, for example, starting the office annually and after, the leaving, uh, after leaving the office. The third one is about electronic system uh, and its functionalities, such as automatic cross-check of information with the government databases in order to be able to identify red flags and uh, conduct a verification based on that, as well as searchability of the system, open data uh, formats, and publication of data. The fourth and fifth one, I will, I will withhold them for a little bit to go into even deeper to show you concrete requirements of the benchmarks. But as you can see, um, the fourth one is about verification that should be risk-based and the necessary follow-up. And the fifth one is about enforcement and sections. Uh, each of these indicators have specific points assigned to them. So you can see the pie chart here where uh, the indicators about enforcement and verification have around 50%. And together with the electronic system, et cetera, the practice combined, uh, comprises 70% uh, of the whole uh, PA assessment. So even if the, the countries have perfect legislation, uh, they will not get more than 30 points under this area. And uh, the assessment uh, ratings uh, are based on this point system uh, that uh, range from outstanding to high average and low. Now, as uh, said, let's go into depth a little bit and have a look what we have in the verification area. Uh, we have um, indicators uh, that uh, talk about dedicated agency and uh, the indicators of practice, such as um, declarations should be verified routinely, uh, but uh, with a specific focus on high risk, on uh, external complaints, um, the files that came into the agency, and uh, if the system has discovered irregularities. Risk-based also includes the red flag analysis. A specific focus is made on an anonymous complaints that have verifiable information to make sure that external voice, the citizen's voice is heard and uh, addressed in the process. Verification should also be prioritized not to block the agency's operation and not to set unrealistic targets, which we have seen in one of the countries where 1,000, uh, 100,000 declarations had to be verified in one year and um, it was an impossible task to, uh, to perform. Um, uh, next indicator is about wide public perception. And here again, we bring in the voice of citizens and uh, civil society, where uh, we ask the governments that their work in terms of asset and interest disclosure is objective, independent, but also seen as such, seen as objective and independent uh, for the uh, stakeholders, um, for the wider public. And lastly, it's about the track record of cases referred to uh, law enforcement based on the verification to make sure that uh, after the verification, the results um, are followed up by the law enforcement agencies if there are signs of illicit enrichment, for example. These little dots here represent the points. So 54222255 two, two, five, five, 
all account to 25 percent or 25 points and this is the quarter of 100 that the country can get under this indicator i will not go into detail of the fifth indicator but just to give you a taste of how we are trying to assess the enforcement in this new methodology um, it's really difficult to set concrete targets for the countries to follow in terms of uh, statistics or figures they need to show. However, it is really important to show some enforcement, right? That's why we attempted to tackle the issue of, uh, in a comprehensive way and included the indicators which require um, existence of practice of dissuasive and proportionate sanctions that is manifested in many different uh, forms of sanctions, such as administrative criminal sanctions, focus on high level corruption, focus on the sanctions that are uh, based on verifications um, uh, from the media and citizen reports. Um, and the last, uh, last indicator, last uh, benchmark talks about the detailed statistics that should be made available um, uh, online. Uh, in terms of enforcement, uh, we try to differentiate from low to high enforcement, and we have specific targets set for each one. These are the levels of details that we don't need at the seminar. So I'll end here. Thank you very much for listening. Over to you, Arisa. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I guess some of our participants wondering whether this system of your indicators will be available somewhere, but maybe there will be a link to the event where people can see presentation in more detail because there was quite a lot of information uh, presented on those slides. But it's, it's very interesting that you are delving much deeper into the verification and enforcement, but also um, making these policies um, you know, implemented and not just being uh, pro forma somewhere in the internet, the, the asset declarations in millions that very few people can make sense uh, the, and that do not deliver policy result. But now I would like to move to an excellent panel who we have that is composed both of practitioners, policymakers, experts who uh, we have been following for decades, and this is not an exaggeration, the evolution of anti-corruption policy, both in the Eastern Europe, Central Asia, but also globally. Uh, I will just briefly introduce who I have with me on the panel in the order that they will be uh, appearing in our conversation. So uh, I would like to welcome Silvio Popa from uh, Buda Bucharest, who is the Secretary General of the Romanian National Integrity Agency that has been set up in 2000. Um, uh, seven and uh, Silvia has been working on anti corruption for more than 12 years. Uh, from Tbilisi, we have Eka um, Gigauri joining us, who is the executive director of Transparency International Georgia. She's um, a prominent civil society actor in the anti corruption field, but uh, Eka was also deputy head of the border police in Georgia. Uh, from Kiev, we have Ruslan Reboshapka who has served at various positions, but he's well known in Ukraine as one of the designers of the anti-corruption infrastructure in Ukraine. He has been the prosecutor general in Ukraine for around seven months. It was brief but intense period of his career, but also Ruslan served uh, in the National um, Agency of on Corruption Prevention and Deputy Minister of Justice. Uh, from Washington, we have Laura Pope, who is senior financial sector specialist with the World Bank, Financial Market Integrity and Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative team. And um, Laura has worked uh, in over 20 countries looking across the regions at uh, provisions for financial disclosure and what it means to use them for corruption uh, prevention uh, in particularly. And last but not least, we have Jeron Michels, who is a policy analyst at the OECD Public Sector Integrity Division. Uh, he has over 15 years of experience in governance, anti-corruption, and program management. So let's go around the table, our virtual table, to discuss what we've heard 
from both Deputy Secretary General and, and Ru Sudan. And I'd like to bring in Silvio first uh, from his vintage point where he is with so much experience and Romania being also in the forefront in Eastern Europe in trying to tackle corruption. Um, we've seen that the level of corruption um, is according to public perception is not decreasing so much as some of these tools that you have in place that's been set up. So how would you say the, uh, the anti-corruption agency in Romania has performed and did the system help to really reduce conflict of interest and decrease illicit enrichment in Romania? Silvio. Thank you, thank you, Orisia. Uh, well, when we are talking about the Romanian assets disclosures for public officials, I think the stars uh, were aligned for us the moment we understood that uh, we have to shift the paradigm from a ticking box approach in uh, implementing the international standards to a system-based approach where the final effectiveness of it the effectiveness of the asset disclosure system is determined by the performance of each of its parts. Scope of the declarations, uh, comprehensive forms, public scrutiny, institutional arrangements, uh, autonomy of the oversight body, sanctions, and so forth. So all these parts, not only in Romanian case, but in general, all these parts are interdependent and fundamental to the success of the whole. And uh, I often compare the assets declaration systems uh, with the solar system. You know, all these components, the star, planets, uh, moons, asteroids, uh, dark matter, cosmic dust, solar wind, etc., are interdependent and fundamental for the entire system not to collapse under its own gravity. And it, uh, of course, it is also in a continuous transformation. Uh, now, back to the Earth. I think the Romanian experience is the story that shows the benefits of a comprehensive approach that focus, focuses both on prevention and sanctioning when it comes to asset disclosure, conflicts of interest, unexplained increase in assets, incompatibilities, and, uh, and so forth. So I know we are on a fast pace here, so let me illustrate uh, this assertion with just two examples from our work. The first one is related to conflicts of interest in public procurement. And this aspect is uh, extremely sensitive since the procurement market in Romania is around 15 billion euros per year. So at first there was our prerogative of investigated consumed conflict of interest that occurred in public procurement. Uh, external signals brought into our attention potential cases of conflict of interest where public procurement contracts were signed with companies held by relatives of the, these public officials. So the penalties for these officials continued to be, let's say, non-dissuasive. But the most important sanction, contracts being canceled and money retrieved to the state budget, uh, was utterly impossible to enforce. So it was clear from this point of view that we had a problem, and the solution to this was to shift the paradigm from the consumed conflicts of interest to the potential conflicts of interest, you know, from sanctioning to prevention. So we developed this system, this IT system, with the purpose of preventing the conflict of interest in public procurement. And what this system does is to automatically check whether participants in a public bid are related to the management of the contractor. And the system predicts the, the likelihood of a potential conflict of interest through a risk rating for each tender. Uh, every time a potential conflict of interest is detected, a warning is automatically issued and brought to the officials uh, in question attention. So this means that they have to take action to remove the cause of the conflict of interest. Uh, very quickly, since it went live three years ago, Prevent System issued uh, around 124 warnings of, of potential conflicts of interest amounting to more than a quarter billion euros. And this is my agency budget for the next 100 years. Uh, two are the most important outcomes of this policy to automatic prevent conflict of interest. The first one, the number of files brought into our attention with consumed conflict of interest in public procurement dropped within the last two years by 52%. And the second one, 
there is an enhanced accountability of the decision factors when it comes to resolving conflicts of interest, since the, complain the compliance rate with the prevent system is more than 90%. Now, let me briefly touch the second issue, the one related to the asset disclosure. So the Romanian asset disclosure system is composed, of course, besides the disclosure process, from a mechanism to detect integrity incidents and a myriad of sanctions attached to, to them. So have in mind that within the last decade, our investigators handled roughly 30,000 cases out of which uh, one third were cases of conflicts of interest, unjustified assets, incompatibilities, or failures to disclose. Thousands of high level officials, members of the parliament, uh, local elected officials, civil servants, police officers were all subjects to our investigation. And this mechanism led to confiscation of several million euros, unjustified increase in assets, uh, hundreds of cases were public officials were removed from their offices uh, due to incompatibility states, for example, and also hundreds of them being banned from occupying any other public positions for a certain period of time. Now, if you're asking me what were the drives of this practical enforcement, I can tell you that all these started from having comprehensive disclosure forms, uh, public access to declarations, uh, and the wide scope, of course, and uh, the system touched all areas of officials with public power prerogatives. The engine that put into motion this mechanism was a central independent oversight body, which is the National Integrity Agency, that used a series of small and large uh, scale instruments, both to detect and sanction these, uh, these incidents. So we see after more than a decade of functioning, we see some interesting outcomes. And let me uh, run you through three of them. The first one, public officials requesting, are requesting more than ever uh, the advisory services from our agency. You know, before taking a new public position or before signing a contract or before filling the assets declaration, uh, the, the public official are approaching the agency. The second one, journalists and citizens are more empowered than ever in conducting their investigation using the public portal of assets uh, declarations and of course our findings. Last but not least, the compliance rate with the disclosure submission and the accuracy of data disclosed significantly increased year after year. But of course, it's not always about rainbows and butterflies. The Romanian system also shows that challenges are still present, especially the ones pertaining to legislation. And I would be more than glad to touch this subject uh, if the time will, uh, will allow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Silvio. I think there will be, and we encourage the participants, we have quite a good turnout at this webinar to think of your questions as our uh, speakers reflect on, on these uh, issues of asset declarations and conflict of interest, and you can type them in in the chat box. So we'll take as much as possible, of course, taking the time constraints. It's, uh, it's fascinating that you made this reference to the solar system. I think in a way, if you want asset declaration and conflict of interest is also part of the bigger galaxy of the anti-corruption measures. And the question is how much they actually uh, prevent and open the way to uncover early instances of corruption to, uh, to basically uh, save public resources for, for much needed uh, uh, for much needed policy implementations. But now let's move into Georgia, who is known in the region uh, as one of the leaders of anti-corruption uh, reform. Uh, and uh, it has accomplished a lot. It has soared in many uh, ratings of anti-corruption, but it has been recently reported in the ACN monitoring report on Georgia that there are risks, especially related to high level corruptions and report recommended uh, strengthening the verification mechanism of asset declarations. Um, so how does Georgian civil society sees right now uh, the performance of the current government? I understand it was pretty much re-election and the same government will continue the policy in the future. Is this government really committed to strengthening this verification mechanisms? If not, why? If yes, what are you expected, expecting to see? Eka. 
Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to um, this conference and roundtable. And um, yes, indeed, we had uh, really uh, very successful reforms. Um, uh, you may remember that we had in, uh, in 2003 the Rose Revolution and after uh, uh, this event. So the, the, at that time, the ruling party has decided to start uh, uh, very effective uh, anti-corruption reform. Uh, and apparently uh, the reforms that we, that took place in police, in customs, and in other such um, agencies were really remarkable and really um, like well known. Uh, when it comes to the um, asset declarations and the system to verify the asset declarations, so first of all, um, from the beginning, so we had two stages actually. The first stage was when the asset declarations became available online. And this was like really very important step forward. Uh, it happened after the Rose Revolution and um, not only the asset declarations, but the information uh, related to the state procurement and the company owners or, and the party finance uh, was also a, a, available online. So. I would say that it would be impossible to uh, to or like monitor the asset declarations without having all these other data also available because um, uh, it was needed to check this right. So and we needed the data for this. Um, at that time, um, um, I would say that the asset declar declarations were uh, not in machine read readable format as well. So it was uh, handwriting, but still it was like you know a very important step forward. So after this, um, still the approach of the government at that time was that these um, uh, declarations uh, uh, had to be like, um, um, kind of monitored by the media and the civil society. There was no uh, asset declaration, like an you know, official monitoring system. So uh, no one was from the state, no one was uh, responsible for monitoring this, uh, the asset declaration. So after that, uh, in 2017, so, um, and that was also a very important step forward for Georgia. Um, um, the, the, uh, uh, we had, uh, we have launched the asset declaration monitoring system, um, and it was very important. But however, a number of shortcomings uh, still are currently limiting the system's uh, effectiveness, I would say. And so I would like to touch uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, issues. The first of all, the monitoring system is focused almost entirely on verification, the accur uh, accuracy and um, completeness of the data provided in the declaration. So, and this is uh, inconsistent with the law whereby the monitoring system should also reveal and prevent conflict of interest and corruption uh, related um, offenses. So, and this was very, uh, this is very important point here. Also, a vast majority of the violations um, uh, which the, in the Civil Society Bureau, which is um, now in charge of monitoring the asset declarations. Um, uh, so the system has revealed to date uh, uh, actually only the, uh, uh, the cases where the accuracy and uh, uh, where the problems were related to the accuracy and the uh, completeness of uh, only. And so this is like, you know, what is not correct here and not, uh, not uh, in line uh, with the law. Uh, also, I should say and bring a little bit of statistics here is that the um, um, Civil Ser Servants Bureau uh, verification of a total of uh, 1,347 asset declarations um, uh, took place in uh, 2000, in 2017 and in 2019, and they identified only nine cases of potential corruption-related offenses that were forwarded to the investigative bodies for further review. So, and in uh, also in such cases also, the Civil Service Bureau does not provide the public with the detailed information of the es uh, essence of the violations and the public um, official that uh, committed the, the like alleged crime. 
Due to this, the nature of the violation and the outcome of the forwarding of the case to the investigation bodies uh, remained unknown for the public and uh, for, for everyone who was like, you know, really interested in this case. But um, meanwhile, also, if we compare um, the monitoring uh, data that we have, so only 90 in 2019, um, 89 declarations were checked uh, um, uh, both by the Transparency International and C uh, Civil Servants Bureau, so in the majority were checked by us. And so um, in the 39 cases, the C uh, Civil Service Bureau did not find any violations. So it looks like, you know, they are, they don't really have political will to look at the cases and to uh, check the data and to like really make um, uh, concrete uh, individuals resp uh, responsible for this. So an another, uh, another problem that we face uh, now here is just uh, the, the recent amendments to the law. And these amendments actually weaken the responsibility of the declarants through the introduction of the concept of a minor violation. And the amendments to the minimum value uh, uh, threshold of assets subject to the uh, declaration and the decrease in size of monetary uh, fines. So it happened actually right after we had very critical report on the asset declarations of the MPs at that time. So and it made them like really very angry because they were criticizing our report during the plenary session as well. So and this was the kind of reaction from the side of the uh, ruling party that they actually amended the law. One additional problem uh, related to the, those amendments was that some of the ch changes such as, such as uh, lifting the obligations to declare companies that have not been operational for the last six years. So, we so what we have now is that in fact in the public um, uh, uh, in the like, you know, uh, according to the public information, so and the uh, special, like, you know, the the uh, public available data. So these um, these companies might be not officially abolished, uh, but they might be active uh, or not active. You know, and we. We can't have the information whether these companies are active if they are not abolished according to the law, you know, and that's like make our um, monitoring system or the monitoring uh, generally like you know, our monitoring like really very complicated. Also, uh, what I wanted to mention is that uh, current system make it uh, impossible for the civil society organizations to monitor uh, adherence to the revolving door regulation since the uh, relevant information on the post-public employ employment of uh, former public officials is not published. And this is also, this makes our life also difficult. The data provided in the asset declarations is uh, also published in PDF format instead of machine readable format. And it's also very difficult for us to analyze this data because of this, uh, this problem. So um, also what, what happens here is that the government has not yet conducted an assessment of the monitoring systems effectiveness, despite the this being one of the OECD ACN's recommendation. And this is also what we are advocating for now. So um, uh, I would say that the, the biggest pro problem uh, is at this point that no adequate reaction, there is no adequate reaction uh, on the conflict of interest case from the relevant agencies. And um, yeah, enforcement is a big problem. Of course, uh, the media helps us to disseminate the information about the po uh, potential conflict of interest cases. But in spite of this, there is no reaction and adequate reaction from the side of the, um, uh, of the relevant agencies. And what I want to say also for for instance, we have this ethics code just that just was just recently adopted um, by the Parliament of Georgia, and also from their side, in spite of the fact that we have actually the kind of um, additional um, legal framework, so still we did not have um, any uh, relevant reactions from the side of the relevant like bodies inside of the uh, parliament. Of course, uh, we okay, don't have the... Please, 
if you could please wrap up because we'll, yeah, yeah. yeah of course we can't like have the um, kind of positive uh, positive uh, expectations because as you said we just had recently the um, uh, uh, the parliamentary elections and we now have the reality that we'll have only one political party in the parliament so in this situation of course it will be um, impossible to request such things from the uh, like you know the only one party in the parliament because uh, for them it will be even very difficult to form the ethics council inside of the parliament okay. thank you very much and i'm ready to answer on your questions thanks i think it's uh, it's important that you stress the um, the paramount relevance of civil society in monitoring uh, and in using those tools that are developed as part of anti-corruption policy to press government for more accountability. And I think another country in the region that is well known for its strong civil society push, like in Georgia, is of course Ukraine. And now I am moving to Ruslan, where Ukraine has introduced one of the most uh, comprehensive systems for asset declarations. I don't know how much Ukraine actually pioneered conflict of interest, but perhaps we could focus on asset declaration because it has been recently a lot in the news with the quite uh, blunt attack by the Constitutional Court to first declare that this asset declaration system is unconstitutional and the information should not be available to the public. I mean, this made a lot of international headlines and actually jeopardized Ukraine's cooperation with international partners. But on the 4th of December, the parliament has passed a new law in installing back the system of e-declarations, but with the um, lower thresholds of responsibility for uh, non-submission or false information. And Ruslan, can, it would be great if you could fill us in into how significant these changes are to uh, the system of e-declarations, how much they will impede the effectiveness of the system. And uh, why do you think from your perspective there was such a strong attack on the uh, asset declaration system? Ruslan, over to you. Thank you, Arisa, and I also would like to thank to OECD for inviting me to, to, this, uh, to this event. Uh, first of all, Ukrainian elites, they have uh, always considered asset declaration system as a threat, and it's a very, uh, really very powerful instrument in the anti-corruption. The asset declaration becomes um, like a headache for high-level politicians, high-level uh, officials, so there are a lot of uh, persons in Ukraine who who would like to, to get rid of uh, asset declaration system at all in, in our country. Um, I remember 2016 and a huge resistance from the political elites in introducing the asset declaration system, and now they choose some, some kind of sophisticated method to, to, to kill the system. Um, so they used uh, constitutional court for that and um, thanks to the, to the Ukrainian civil society and to the Ukrainian president, which who requested an opinion from the Venice Commission uh, of the Council of Europe. And Venice Commission of the Council of Europe also considered this constitutional court decision of like um, not... Um, uh, not fully based on international standards and recommended to the Parliament of, of Ukraine to reinstate the anti-corruption legislation which existed uh, before the 27th of October, the date of uh, rendering this decision of the Constitutional Court. The Parliament has made the first step. Uh, the Parliament reinstated the criminal liability, just the issue of criminal liability for the false declaring and non-submitting of e-declarations. And then the next step should be done, the law on um, reinstating the powers of the National Agency of Corruption Prevention should be uh, reinstated. And the uh, relevant uh, draft law has already, has already been um, drafted and submitted to the parliament. So we are waiting for the next step from the Ukrainian uh, parliament. Um, what else, who, who are the beneficiaries of this um, bizarre decision of the Constitutional Court? First of all, uh, as I mentioned, there are a lot of politicians and officials who are, um, I would say, happy 
uh, from the decisions because uh, National Anti-Corruption Bureau has started a lot, it's more than hundreds investigations con uh, connected to the false declaring, connected to the illicit enrichment against high level officials and, pol and politicians like members of the parliament, ministers, for former ministers. Uh, heads of state-owned enterprises, so it's, uh, it's it becomes a real threat for them. Uh, the next um, part of beneficiaries are um, those who we call uh, oligarchs, because they they are not um, they are not trying not to undermine only the uh, asset declaration system, but the whole anti-corruption infrastructure. There were attacks against National Anti-Corruption Bureau which is investigating now the, a lot of cases against oligarchs, uh, for example, connected to the uh, private bank fraud, um, where one of the most powerful oligarchs is uh, involved. And the third part is uh, uh, pro-Russian MPs who start initiated these proceedings in the Constitutional Court. And even Security and Defense Council stated that there, is, there was uh, external influence they are suspecting such kind of external influence, uh, interference in this, uh, in this case. So there are three different group of um, beneficiaries from this uh, uh, decision of the Constitutional Court. But on the other hand, um, Ukraine has a very powerful uh, civil society. Uh, due to civil society activity in 2016, the asset declaration has been established, has been invented in Ukraine. And now I'm, I'm feeling, uh, I feel optimistic because of uh, such uh, power of, from, of uh, civil society in Ukraine. So I hope that the uh, asset declaration system will be reinstated in Ukraine and it will be reinstated, reinstated very soon. Thank you. But, but Ruslan, from your opinion on the mod modified now law on asset declarations and lower penalties, if you want, for those who are non-declaring and increasing the, 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 the amount of um, in assets that has to be declared. Do you think this will uh, weaken the system or the system will still be able to perform its function? That will definitely weaken the system of uh, preventing the corruption because uh, the sanctions should be um, should be dissuasive and should be preventive. So even Venice Commission of Council of Europe, they also stressed that there should be um, provided an imprisonment for, for some um, aggravated cases of non-submitting declaration or false declare. That uh, was one of the reasons why civil society and me as well, we are insisting on vetoing uh, uh, this, uh, this law and we demanded from the president of Ukraine to, to, to use the veto and then to, to, to redraft the law and to, to use also more severe sanctions in the, uh, for, for non-submitting declaration and false declare. Okay, so this, this battle will continue and this is something Absolutely. to watch how it's, Ukraine will calibrate. It's never, I would say that it's never an end, end in story. So we have to be prepared every day for any surprises like this decision from the Constitutional Court. Okay, thank you so much for clarifying that. And now I'd like to move to Laura, who is really following the development of practices in conflict of interest and asset declarations globally, because they are, uh, there are established standards that are uh, they are regulated by the UN Convention Against Corruption, and uh, it'd be interesting to see what good practices can the region of Eastern Europe and Central Asia take away from some other countries around the globe. Laura. Uh, thank you, Orisia. Uh, thank you uh, to the OECD, uh, you know, for this, uh, you know, great opportunity to uh, to share this panel with um, with such uh, esteemed experts um, and practitioners. Uh, I, you know, the issue of um, um, sort of asset declarations around the world. Um, we as uh, global institutions, we think about this practically many times because we're trying to bring good practices, you know, from uh, 
from uh, Eastern Europe or the ASEAN region to other regions and vice versa. Uh, so we are doing uh, a little bit similar work with uh, the OECD in, in, um, in this respect. Um, and I think about these components of the asset declaration system as a, a little bit as like product, so to speak, you know, is it an import product or, a, you know, something you want to export? And there are some features of asset declaration system in, in the ACN um, that, first of all, need to be exported to other parts of the ACN network, as uh, Rusudan, uh, you know, explained uh, in her presentation, because uh, the systems in the ACN network are not homogenous at all. Um, and then there are, you know, features that, you know, you want to uh, take to other regions, and that's actually something that you know, we have done um, and we have even brought practitioners from ASEAN countries to South Asia, to Africa, to Latin America. And there's a great interest in the experience uh, from this region in, in other parts of the world. So I think some of the features that, you know, I would want to see exported um, are, uh, for example, you know, when you're looking at the content of ASA declarations, and this is something that was touched upon in Rusudan's presentation as well, is this comprehensiveness um, and having, you know, both comprehensiveness and sort of targeted um, requirements for disclosures. So including, you know, beneficial ownership. So declaration of assets that are owned by officials and their family members as beneficial owners, assets that are not just registered in their names. This is something that, you know, um, there are countries in the ACN regions that have pioneered, so to speak, and, you know, it would be great to see this more. Um, there's also, um, you know, the use of, use of electronic tools. I mean, we have heard from different panelists, you know, um, the ACN has really been at the forefront of this. Um, you know, electronic filing, but also now more and more um, electronic uh, verification. So, you know, more specifically um, using automatic um, uh, checks, um, you know, to identify high risk declarations so that, you know, you don't do just the formalistic checks of declaration just because they were filed late or, you know, something like, you know, other similar formalistic approaches to verification. Um, and I think this has really the power to be transformative. Um, you know, in terms of the effectiveness of declaration. So, you know, definitely there's, um, you know, there's a lot to, to look forward to. Then there's the issue of um, information or um, information that can be accessed in the process of verification. Um, there are, you know, some countries in, in uh, the ACN network where asset declaration agencies can, you know, access tax information um, or, you know, information from uh, financial institutions. And this is something that is not, you know, sort of uh, the case all over the world and even within the ACN network. Um, the other, you know, another sort of, um, um, when it comes to public access, um, the, I think some ACN countries have shown that you can strike um, a balance between um, having very comprehensive public access, but also, you know, uh, making sure that there aren't, you know, serious threats to the security um, and the privacy of public officials. Um, and that is something that, you know, that message, even, you know, brought by practitioners from the region has been very powerful in other parts of the world where there is a lot of apprehension when it, when, uh, when it comes to seeing uh, very uh, broad public access. And the fact is that, you know, when it comes to this issue, it's really good to see, you know, it's one thing to talk about it theoretically um, and speculate over what might happen and what are the risks. But, you know, you see a number of countries where, you know, there's comprehensive public access, there are mitigation and, you know, controls that are put in place and things, you know, have worked out, uh, you know, quite, quite well. Um, and then there's also, you know, just in terms of mm, uh, sort of a, a very positive development is also something that we have heard from some from Silviu in, in Romania, the use of technology, but also for identifying potential conflicts of interest, but more, but more generally thinking not only about sanctioning and punishing public officials, but also working with them to identify potential conflicts of interest, to advise them, um, because not, you know, not 
everyone has, you know, bad intentions, so to speak. So that is, you know, something, and, and this also brings me to, you know, what, um, you know, could be imported more in, uh, in the region. And I think that is one of the things that, you know, needs to be given more attention. And, you know, there's also something that you see more in o o OECD countries, this whole more, um, a sort of support system for conflict of interest that is appears throughout the public sector. Because right now what we see in the ACN countries is that mostly responsibilities related to conflict of interest are more or less on the shoulders of the specialized um, agencies. And that is not enough. So seeing, for example, that before you have public officials that, you know, start their, uh, you know, public service, that there is a review of their uh, declarations for identifying potential conflicts of interest and resolving them even before they come into, you know, they start their mandate. So that would be, you know, that would be very powerful. And I think the logic is similar to what we have heard on procurement, that you want to solve the problems before they, you know, they turn into regulations or contracts or things that are much harder to, to, to reverse. So I will stop here and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Laura. It's, it's a very interesting list and, and I think it's, uh, it makes, uh, uh, I'm sure a lot of people in our uh, webinar uh, think about some of these best practices and being a bit proud for the region as well, because you know, it's, uh, it's important to celebrate the achievements. It's a very difficult fight against the entrenched system. So thank you very much for bringing, you know, a certain pride in what the Eastern Europe and Central Asia can, can uh, bring to the world. But also, I think it's important point about the more convergent across the region, if possible. But of course, the political system differs so much. If you just take this very region, you know, and I think from Romania, from Romania to Kyrgyzstan, there's, there's, quite, a, there's quite a difference in, in political culture as well. But uh, last but not least, I would like to bring Jeron and kind of zoom back into the OECD region of, uh, you know, well-developed, uh, well-governed countries and, and, to, and to learn uh, from your perspective whether you see what is happening in ACN countries is more of a convergence with what is uh, what are the practices at the OECD countries, or do you see some kind of special model emergence uh, emerging uh, compared to um, to core OECD? Jeron, over to you. All right, uh, thanks a lot. And I mean, first of all, I'm very honored to be part of this uh, panel discussion today. And I want to start with complimenting the colleagues from the ACN Secretariat with the launch of this excellent report. So please, everyone. Uh, download it, read it, it has very useful information. And I would like to connect indeed the, the findings of the report and also the, the, the key messages from, from the discussion and the inspiring examples with what we see in, in OECD countries. Um, and I mean, some of the, the things are a bit repetition, but um, I would like to add some, some examples also from OECD countries to, to, to bring that perspective. So first of all, I will not use the uh, galaxy uh, metaphors, but uh, indeed uh, asset declaration should be embedded in, in a broader approach for managing conflict of interest in, in curbing illicit enrichment, uh, taking into account risk areas such as pre and post employment, lobbying, uh, linkages to beneficial ownership uh, regulations, etc. And there, a good example maybe is, is the High Authority for Transparency in Public Life of uh, France, uh, which is the agency responsible for ensuring effective uh, auditing of asset and interest, interest declarations, but also uh, monitoring uh, post-public employment provisions. Uh, and also uh, the agency is, is dealing with uh, implementation of the, of the lobbying regulation. So I think it's important to, to put this a bit in, in this perspective, the broader perspective of, of managing conflict of interest uh, more broadly. And then the second, uh, I mean, building on the examples again, uh, uh, from, uh, from the ACN uh, region, the use of technology and digitalization, uh, both for submission uh, of uh, asset declarations and for data verification. So, so the use of technology can really contribute to reducing the human error and can, can render the whole process um, much more efficient um, and also facilitate then uh, public, as, uh, public access to uh, asset declaration information. I mean, there, uh, many examples uh, from Mexico, there is the Declaranet uh, uh, 
a platform um, which not only allows uh, Mexican federal public officials to declare their assets, but also the publication page allows um, the public to, to search by name uh, and, and, and cross-check the, the information there. Um, then moving back to France, um, the, the high authority has designed a specific software uh, solution for the management of, of the declarations that are submitted online. It, it's called ULIS. Uh, and, and there's another software that is compatible to that. And that's maybe quite uh, innovative, uh, a media monitoring software. So basically our TAMI software is called, it, it checks the information uh, that is publicly available on the internet and in open sources against the asset and interest declarations of, um, of public officials. And, and the last example there, maybe from uh, Korea, uh, the Korean uh, platform is called Public Ethics and Transparency Initiative. Uh, this is integrated with uh, other databases from, from the government, with uh, financial information, with the registers on property, the registers on vehicles, um, some um, bank databases with financial information. So, so that allows the, the data um, to be cross-checked uh, almost in real time. So this is uh, an example I would like to share with you. Um, and then third, moving more into the, the auditing of asset declarations. Well, one aspect has been touched upon already is the regulatory framework and the mandate to obtain information from tax authorities, from other public institutions. And there again, we can look at, at France um, where uh, the high authority has indeed the, the mandate to, uh, to obtain information from all other uh, public, but also from individual persons needed uh, in the auditing process of, uh, of the asset declarations. Um, and then in, indeed a very promising trend that we see is the, the use of technology in the detection of, uh, of, of outliers, irregularities uh, through data analytics. So with uh, special software detecting unusual patterns, uh, and this then these red flags should then lead to, of course, uh, a more uh, detailed audit. Um, so uh, I will stop here. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have some questions coming in coming in in the chat. So we would like to invite also other participants to. Um, to express your views and also ask questions. If you have uh, your question directed to a particular uh, speaker, you can, you can write it uh, as such, but uh, otherwise uh, I will be distributing them at, at uh, my discretion. And I would like to take a question that came from Sergio Sanikidze, uh, I imagine from Georgia. Uh, and I would like to address it to Silvio. Uh, Ser Sergo is asking uh, with regards to uh, determining the circle of family members who should be included in the declaration for the official person, uh, uh, for government officials and how wide or narrow the circle should be. For example, should family members who do not live in the same household be included? Silvi, what is the best practice in, in this regards? So thank you for the question. It's a very pinpoint uh, question. And uh, let me tell you that um, usually in most of the constituencies all, all over the world, the family acts, the family composed from spouses and maybe the dependent uh, children uh, acts as a household meaning that they pool incomes and expenses together. So this is important to the extent of the fact that uh, when a central oversight body will be in charge of uh, conducting a full audit on the uh, unjustified assets, for example, uh, they will look uh, not only on the assets and incomes produced by the declarant, but also the expenses uh, and the incomes produced by uh, his uh, spouse uh, or her spouse or, and by uh, their dependent children. So I think the level of detail uh, must be linked with the family members, the family members that live in the same, in the same household. Uh, if, you, if, if we are thinking about the parents, I don't think um, 
uh, assets disclosures form should include the same level of detail as in the case of the spouses. Uh, of course, transa transactions and uh, gifts from uh, parents or for other members of the family should be reflected um, in uh, another uh, section of the declaration. But the practice is that it's much comfortable for the declarant because uh, it needs a lot of time to when uh, he's due to fill in the declaration uh, and also for the oversight body to check this information to be more efficient. I think it should be limited only to the family members. Thank you. But maybe we'll bring in the Rusudan who will reflect how this um, will be measured in these performance indicators that you presented at the beginning. What would be the requirement there? Well, in fact, the answer to this question is pretty brief. Uh, rationale here is that unless we bring in the family members in the asset declarations, there are risks that asset declaration systems may be ineffective because assets and interests may be acquired in the name of the family member, but will not be disclosed in the, in the form for public scrutiny. So uh, for us uh, in the performance indicators, we're using the concept of uh, household, family household, and we have at least spouse and members of the family that live in the same household. Um, uh, that is a really short answer to this. Oh, okay, thank you so much. And um, there, there's also a question related to the balance of information that is available to the public and that is uh, only available to the anti-corruption prevention agencies. So perhaps I'll invite Ruslan Aneka from Georgia and Ukrainian experience from after having these systems in place. Do you see, first of all, what is the balance? Is all information available to public? Anybody can go and check. And do you think it's the right balance that Ukraine and Georgia strike in this regard. Maybe we'll start with Eka and then go to Ruslan. So I think that um, uh, when it comes to the public official, right, so it's, it's really very important to ensure uh, their transparency. Um, and the information about their income should be like available. It is uh, very important to do this. Uh, and also about the like, you know, the assets of uh, their like family members, right? So, um, because otherwise, uh, how would like ensure the, the uh, transparency, right? Like, you know, it would be impossible. And from the moment uh, they become the public servants, they should take the responsibility and be as transparent as possible. This is, uh, this is my answer to this question. Of course, um, there might be some personal information, but we are not talking about the personal information here according to our law. So it's like really the information that uh, that is needed in order to uh, to make their, uh, sure that they are acting transparently and also to make sure that uh, the monitoring of their assets uh, is effective. Thanks, Eka. Uh, I mean, in the report, ladies and gentlemen, if you go, you will see on page 95 quite detailed text box of all the information that Ukrainian asset declaration demands, and it includes gifts and income and financial liabilities to uh, quite, uh, uh, quite detail. So, Ruslan, uh, do you think it was the right <coughs> design of that system? And maybe perhaps because we do know how, especially in Ukraine, government officials are skilled in hiding their assets through the their keen and extended family. Um, you, what was the practice and the, what have you seen in Ukraine with regards to family members? So maybe you can reflect on these two uh, points. Mm -hmm. First, I would like to start with the previous question and uh, to note that the introducing of asset declaration system in Ukraine, it leads uh, lead to, uh, to increasing the number of divorces in Ukraine uh, among the top politicians and uh, officials. But it, it, frankly, it doesn't help because of um, the activity. It's quite easy to trace the, like Silvio says, uh, quite easy to, 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 to trace this uh, common spends uh, uh, or common, um, uh, common travels, for example. So it's, uh, it's, not, um, it's not a problematic issue for anti-corruption bureau or anti-corruption agency to establish the fact of uh, of having a household and uh, and all the consequences, 
Um, what is happening now with the uh, asset declarations in Ukraine? Um, yes, I agree that the um, Ukrainian example, Ukrainian uh, asset declaration, declaration is very, very detailed and we demand a lot of information to be uh, submitted. At the same time, uh, officials and politicians subject of, for declaring, they are also very sophisticated. So it's like a competition between us, between anti-corruption uh, infrastructure and between officials. They are trying to hide uh, the assets and the anti-corruption body, they are learning how to, to find them. So there is like a common patterns on how to, find, to hide the assets and uh, common um, experience from anti-corruption bodies how to, how to find them. Uh, the issue of the Institute of Beneficial Owners is, um, is very helpful for the anti-corruption bodies. So it's, uh, um, it helps a lot in terms of ide identifying the real uh, owners and uh, identifying the assets that could be hidden from the declared in asset declarations. And while but it's I also, have... sorry, it's also like a never ending story. So it's a continuing comp competitions and it means that you should, anti-corruption bodies should be always to be prepared for, for new inventions in, in anti-corruption methods. Mm. And while I have you, Ruslan, here, because we, we are staying on the family on the family issue, here's the question with regards to uh, siblings and adult children. The participant says, often a brother or a sister or an adult child holds questionable assets and acts on behalf of the officials. You cannot divorce your children or siblings. Is, yeah, absolutely. Are, they, are they to be included in Ukraine on asset declarations? If they are living together with the subject of declaration, they should, they have to to be included into the into the declaration. And if they um, if they are not living with, together, they should use uh, another institute of beneficial owners. If they act on behalf of the official or politician, they also should be declared. This information should be included into the asset declaration. And, and maybe um, I'll, I'll turn into Laura because she has a real global view. How much of this um, um, family circle is really a problem and how much it's used as a practice to disguise some of the illegal assets? Is this really an area where uh, anti-corruption uh, agencies and also anti-corruption activists should focus to ensure that this is uh, covered in the uh, regulation? Yes, absolutely. That is one of the key uh, key issues in an asset declaration system. I mean, you know, your coverage of family members, and because of you know what ha what has been mentioned before, uh, you know, by including by Ruslan, is that ultimately, you know, you cannot really. So there, the basic rule is you cover the members of the household and you know the spouse. Um, and the, the minor children. Um, but then going beyond that, the only instrument that can help is the beneficial ownership because there have been attempts in other countries to include siblings and aunts and grandparents, but that is just too onerous because you cannot you know, expect public officials in good faith to know about all of the interests and assets of all of their you know, extended family members. So that is really the, you know, the, 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 the option that is used. But what we see in other countries is that you have countries now in the world where, you know, you, uh, only public officials have to declare their assets, not even their spouses or minor children. And in those cases, you know, you're going to have a problem, uh, you know, uh, as, uh, as we have uh, heard a lot. And then in some um, systems, there's also the question, you know, do you go beyond, you know, do you go in, even in terms of when you're taking the, the concept of household, you know, even covering domestic partners, and then how, what is the rule to determine that, you know, um, a person should be covered by the requirement or, or not? Rusudan, would you like to add another point? 
Oh, sure, yes. Uh, regarding the family members, I guess, because we are still talking about this. Well, the key is that each country determines their own uh, a circle of who is included as a family member, depending on the country context. And the imagination co can go too far, such as, for example, we can have the situations of mothers and fathers-in-law being the uh, you know, formal owners of the assets and interests. Uh, uh, but again, uh, the minimum requirement and coupled with the beneficial information disclosure should be enough, I think. And Ruslan, I think, wanted to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead, Ruslan. If I may. Yes. Uh, from, my, uh, from my experience um, as a prosecutor general, I would say that uh, using family members who hide in assets is quite primitive, uh, very simple way to, to hide or disguise the, the assets. Um, more sophisticated issue is uh, establishing a change, chain of legal persons, particularly established uh, in some, some way in uh, offshore. Mm -hmm. So it's, in this case, it's much, much more complicated to find uh, the final beneficial owners and to find uh, assets, real assets. So I would emphasize that anti-corruption bodies should not uh, like follow very much for, on, uh, after the members of the fam family members but to, 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 to draw their attention on uh, finding the final beneficial owners. Oh, thank you very much. Um, we only have 10 minutes left, even less than, and maybe it would be interesting for all of us and for our participants to look a little bit forward into the next year, because of course we focus today on asset declarations and conflict of interest, but we all know that the region faces the challenge of high level corruption. And maybe if we go around the table in the opposite order that we were starting from the very beginning, if you were to identify, I understand there's no silver bullet it, but something that knowing where the region is right now in its um, ecosystem of fighting corruption, where would you like to see more focus next year? Uh, and where should uh, organizations like OECD in particularly uh, invest their attention? So Jeron, and then we'll go to Laura. Um, yeah, I think it's it's good to look forward, and I want to build actually on the point that uh, that Laura already brought forward. I think for the ACN region, it will be very important to focus on uh, public integrity measures more general. Um, I mean, some some countries really have an advanced system for asset declaration, and I think that there are some really good examples uh, in the region. Um, but we also need to look at uh, public employment at conflict of uh, interest, uh, uh, management solutions, uh, codes of conduct, um, reporting lines for, for public servants. Uh, many of the integrity instruments that, that exist uh, should, be, should be also addressed with the same attention as, uh, as the declarations. And they're also in particular focusing on the implementation because we see that many ASEAN countries do have a lot of instruments in, in place but uh, the implementation is often lacking. So if I have to summarize it, uh, implementation focus for, for public interest, uh, for, for public integrity, uh, I think that's, uh, that's a challenge ahead. Laura. Um, I would say that um, looking forward, one, um, one important aspect is to have uh, perhaps better cooperation between um, asset declaration agencies and law enforcement um, so that, you know, we see in some countries that um, there's almost sort of unhealthy competition between the two and that, you know, in order to be um, effective, um, you know, and especially dealing with high level corruption, an asset declaration system agency on its own cannot fight high level corruption. And there are a lot of expectations now in many countries that having just an asset, a great asset declaration system is going to be the silver bullet. And I think that, you know, we have to come to terms that just having a good asset declaration system in place will not, you know, help combat high level corruption. Um, so it's the cooperation um, between, you know, the agencies and sort of understanding their mandate and being comfortable with what their mandate is that, you know, asset declaration agencies are not law enforcement agencies as well. Um, um, and also, um, 
you know, uh, this also has other implications because, you know, we're talking a lot about beneficial ownerships. And in some countries, um, there has even been resistance from asset accretion agencies to introduce beneficial ownership in the legislation because they're saying, well, an asset accretion agency will never have the tools to prove that, you know, um, a, a certain official is the beneficial owner of an asset because they don't have, you know, they can only check registries and, you know, and other information. And that will not appear necessarily in a, in a registry. So I think that would be sort of, uh, you know, something to to work on uh, in the future, to have a team approach, I guess, to this bigger problem. Yes, thank you very much. Eka. I'm sorry, we'll go to Ruslan first and then to Eka. Ruslan. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I'm, I think that it's very important to conduct the in a new way uh, evaluation round by the ACN OECD, which is I would, I would say it's very complicated to use these new indicators, but it also opens a, a new possibility for ACN, for ECD, and for member uh, countries, mem uh, which are members of ACN. So I wish a great success because it's extremely complicated work for them. I would, um, I would stress on uh, international cooperation in terms of um, exchanging information about uh, assets, about uh, uh, banking accounts and so on. And uh, perhaps uh, one more important issue, it's reducing number of offshore countries because it's a huge obstacle in international cooperation and in fighting not only in, uh, corruption, but uh, it's in fighting against the uh, criminal in general. Thank you, Eka. Um, okay, so I think that we should look at the region from the from the angle that, you know, we are in a crisis, and uh, you know this crisis will be deeper after the 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 COVID will be over, right? So, and we see that, you know, many governments in many parts of the world are using this kind of crisis in order to really uh, like enrich themselves and really use the system uh, to um, uh, to create the like you know new uh, corruption systems and this is uh, this is what we should take into consideration in and in all this of course the space for the civil society is shrinking and i think that you know we might have good uh, like laws kind of like you know good systems but then at the same time we need very active citizens civil society media and uh, because without them so in the system where there is no political will to fight the corruption so uh, it's um, impossible to like really to advocate for the better future of the countries right so that's why i think that the special focus should be made on the like you know watchdogs and the civil society and like the active citizens thank you thank you aka silvio well there is no doubt that the assets disclosure system gains more and more traction and popularity but we have to manage our expectations results will be tangible uh, in time. And my take is that this methodology the OECD and ACN put it into place will be a game changer for the next year because uh, international standards are adapted into pinpoint clear indicators and benchmarks. You know, by having scores awarded on each performance areas, we can determine a score for the, for the country efforts. And by having objective, tangible, measurable indicators, everybody will have an unbiased perspective about one country's performance in the fight against corruption. And uh, the community must go far further and uh, develop the standards. In my opinion, three are the next big things to be approached. The beneficial ownership introduced in declarations, mechanism for verifying assets stored abroad, and third, electronic verification of assets and interest disclosure. Thank you. I think you, you've given an excellent, succinct summary of many things we've discussed, Silvio. And uh, I think the, especially the last round it is in a way a roadmap for next year. I, I certainly see a lot of very practical ideas and it's good to hear positive feedback about Ru Sudan's presentation on indicators. Uh, so our discussion made me think about this famous corruption formula that 
says that corruption equals monopoly plus discretion minus accountability. So when you keep this in place, we need all those elements to be, and I think as the declaration on conflict of interest helps to uh, re uh, limit discretion, increase accountability, and hopefully uh, overall, over time, decrease corruption. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our, our time is coming up. I would like to thank all the speakers from joining us uh, throughout uh, Europe and across Atlantic today. It's been a a great pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing all your insights and experience. Uh, and thank you, uh, over 100 participants who are still with us uh, following this conversation. I would like to wish all of this uh, anti corruption network and a wider community of anti corruption activists, policymakers, a uh, very happy next year. Definitely much better than this, than this year, so that we can also meet in person because. Uh, of, uh, um, policy discussions need face-to-face -face conversations very often. So let's hope we can meet face-to-face -face next year. Wishing you all the best, stay well, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Yeah.